Welcome everyone to NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Tonight's presentation is titled Introduction to Biology, The Secret of Life, Pedagogical Implications, Discussion 2. Our presenters are Graham Walker, Zipporah Miller, Susan Koba, and Ann Tweed. My name is Brent Slate, and I'll be moderating the program. And Jeff Lehman is here to provide technical support. Before we jump into our presentation, I did want to remind everyone to visit the NSTA Learning Center, which is your online portal for over 10,600 resources for science educators. And when you navigate into the Learning Center, you'll find that currently we have over 3,700 free resources, and that number is increasing all the time. Um, you always have the option of adding resources to your My Library area so you can get to those when it's a good time for you. Um, we have community forums, which uh, allow you to connect with other science teachers from across the country and around the world. And we do have online advisors who are available via our live support button to help you find what you're looking for. In addition to that, we do have free tools that will help you organize your professional learning and reach your goals. And it's all available by going to learningcenter.nsta.org. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. First, we'll have Graham Walker, a professor at MIT and Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We will have Zipporah Miller with us, and she's our Associate Executive Director of Professional Programs and Conferences here at NSTA. And then we will have our featured presentation by our NSTA Press authors, Susan Koba and Ann Tweed. So let's go ahead and get things started. I'll pass it over to Graham Walker to give us some highlights from 700X. OK, well, hello, everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to, to be here. I've been, although you haven't been seeing, seeing me on camera, I've been working with Eric on this course for months and uh, been at all his lectures. And I've been organizing a series of faculty videos I hope you're starting to see. And, just let you know that um, both Eric and I are excited that you're able to participate. So in uh, the highlights from week six to eight, briefly, um, in the lecture on DNA is the hereditary material. That's sort of an exciting one for Eric because he's been drawing this little triangle with the biochemistry and genetics. And this was the lecture he closes it to uh, um, with the discovery of DNA. And Eric took a very historical approach to introducing how this important concept was developed, beginning with the experiments of Fred Griffith working with Streptococcus pneumoniae in London in the 1920s, and how his studies were then picked up by Avery McLeod and McCarty, who really showed that DNA was the material, the genetic material, but shows how science, the, the ideas are always um, accepted right away, and how the Hershey Chase experiment um, involving phage actually did it. And he slides from that into the race for a story of the race to solve the structure of DNA that eventually Watson and Crick uh, came up with the correct structure. And so a lot of history in that uh, lecture. Uh, he picks up on the what's said to be the coyest sentence in the scientific literature at the end of the DNA paper about it not having escaped Watson and Crick's notice that the um, specific pairing that they postulated suggests a way of uh, copying the genetic material and goes in the next lecture in DNA replication into how that process happens. He begins again with the experiment of Musselson and Stahl, which laid down the principle that it was semi-conservative um, DNA replication, gets the students to um, realize that there has to be an enzyme that's going to join the sub-building blocks together and tells the story of Arthur Kornberg uh, found that enzyme. And then uh, takes them from that simple concept into some of the complexities of actually replicating a double-stranded DNA molecule with the leading and lagging strands and how you have to need to think about other things such as primases or topoid isomerases. It does a nice little bit on, uh, the, on the fidelity, which is so important, emphasizing both the proofreading and the mismatch repair. And then in the next lecture on the central dogma translation, uh, transcription and translation, he really shows how to close that part of the triangle from getting from a gene to a protein. 
and Eric uh, introduces the, the students to uh, RNA, pointing out how similar it is to DNA at a chemical level, which is that uh, extra hydroxyl there, uh, and how transcription allows the cell to make a copy the information in the DNA into an RNA. And that leads him into a discussion of both the, the genetic code, how it works, and then he highlights how it was discovered through the contributions of Nuremberg and particularly features those from Gobind Karana, our former colleague at MIT who just died. And those, I encourage all of you to watch that little uh, video of Gobind Karana talking about what it was like growing up in India. It's very powerful. Um, and then to get the protein, the mRNA translated, he brings in the idea of the adapter or the translator that Francis Crick uh, proposed, which you now know as tRNA, and about how the ribosome works. And Eric uses that to talk about the fact that it's actually RNA in the ribosome that catalyzes the formation of the peptide bond, which lets him even uh, speculate a bit about the possibility of an RNA world, which I know the students found quite interesting after the lecture. Um, in the next uh, lecture, the variations on the central dogma, um, I thought this was a kind of exciting lecture because Eric really engaged the students in a discussion of the various ways that you could uh, possibly transmit genetic information and it ranged from RNA directed RNA polymerases, which some sage do, and then importantly to the reverse transcriptase that the um, uh, retroviruses use, uh, such as HIV. And David Baltimore, who was our former colleague at MIT, was important in that. This is a, it was a lecture full of uh, Nobel Prizes because he then uh, introduced the students uh, to the idea that in uh, eukaryotes you have RNA splicing and showed them one of the figures from Phil Sharp's original uh, paper here, um, done here, where he discovered RNA splicing. Again, I encourage you to watch the Phil Sharp video and hear him talk about that himself. And then uh, went from that to talk about some of the other variations you see, including alternative splicing and how that allows the cell to generate extra diversity. Um, in the uh, week eight, uh, he does a very interesting and ambitious lecture. I've never seen him do it before, um, or I haven't done it either, on beta galactosidase and beta globin. A uh, tale of two genes, where he looks specifically at two genes in detail. And Eric uses beta galactosidase to introduce the idea, get the students to think about the idea that DNA, excuse me, that genes need to be regulated. And I think there's a really interesting look on how he's tuning his teaching to his audience. They're MIT students, they're quite computer literate. So he introduced the idea of the need for gene replication by having the students write a computer rule that laid down the conditionality as to when you would want, a cell would want to express beta galactosidase and then takes them through a very interesting discussion about how you would actually implement that sort of code uh, in the context of a cell. I hope some of you might find that inspirational. You could see if there's something that would excite your students and maybe you could teach a topic in a way that would uh, allow them to interact with you the way he got the MIT students to interact with him. In the back part of that, he introduces them to beta globin, one of the components of hemoglobin. And again, there's a wonderful discussion with the students because uh, Eric told them about Murphy's Law where any, whatever can go wrong uh, does, and then got them to suggest things that could possibly go wrong with uh, with uh, beta globin. And as you see, if you watch that lecture, very many of them actually go wrong in that way in in nature. And he also makes a connection between the sickle cell mutation, which seems so puzzling that it would be there, but that it causes some uh, protection against malaria. And then finally, in the uh, last lecture in week eight, cloning and purifying uh, gene, I think you see Eric uh, teaching a, a subject by focusing really on the central concepts, trying not to lose the students in the jargon of the, the field. He talks about how you need to have cut and paste, you need scissors and glue, and 
We suggest to get the scissors, you ask the experts, which are bacteria, and they <clears throat> introduces them to restriction enzymes. And DNA ligase is the glue. Uh, the idea of a <clears throat> vector is a molecule that knows how to replicate. So your job is, when you're cloning is to attach your piece of DNA or pieces of DNA to the vector so that they can replicate inside the cell. And then takes them back through transformation and selection, which they'd already heard about in the lectures. So there's a sort of very quick tour through the highlights of uh, week six to eight. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. Um, at this point, I think we'll go ahead and uh, see if anyone has any questions. So feel free to type those in, um, folks, now. And uh, we'll give you a chance to get your content questions answered directly by uh, one of our professors from the course. So feel free to type those into the chat window. And uh, I'll actually, I think, go back to the highlights slide so you can um, remember some of what you have covered. So we will take your questions in the chat and uh, give Dr. Walker a chance to respond before we jump into our pedagogical implications. And uh, Dr. Walker, while we're waiting, maybe um, you can give us a, a sneak peek on what's coming up um, in week nine, um, give folks some uh, excitement about what they're going to be looking at next. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the cloning uh, gene is just the beginning. If you take uh, all the DNA from a human and you cut it into little pieces and attach it to the vector, or from any organism and attach it to a vector, now you have to find the gene that, that you're interested in in that library. And that's the next topic that Eric uh, takes on the various what he calls tricks for cloning and uh, walks through some of the strategies that scientists have used to then identify the pieces of DNA they're interested in and then um, goes from that to once you've, say, found a clone with the piece of DNA you're interested in, how you uh, analyze it and um, takes introduces the students to gel electrophoresis the concept of uh, DNA sequencing and then the actual the implementation of DNA sequencing. And I think, uh, as many of you are probably aware, Eric uh, ran the genome center that uh, sequenced about a third of the human genome. He's been a leader in sequencing DNA, and so he's really uh, on his home turf when he got to that lecture and talked about how the uh, the uh, cost of DNA sequencing has dropped a million fold from the uh, time that the draft, first draft of the human genome sequence was out. So it's an astonishing uh, uh, increase in our ability to sequence. And of course, Eric enthuses, as you would guess, about the implications of that. And he takes them also through, in a very simple way, how the polymerase chain reaction works and the extraordinary power of that very, very uh, simple idea. Um, so that's week nine from my uh, looking, what I remember <laughs> from looking at the titles of the, uh, uh, of the lectures. Um, and then Eric, after that, branches more deeply into genomics, which is something of, you know, he spent his life uh, looking at the human genome, and so he starts after that in the subsequent lectures to get into how you find uh, genes associated with human genome with uh, human diseases and the various challenges of, uh, of undertaking that kind of uh, enterprise. Wonderful. That is a uh, sounds like some exciting content coming up uh, for the teachers as well, and. Um, It'll be uh, interesting to see what um, what comes from that, and as teachers think about applying that, um, I'll give everyone a, just another moment here um, to submit any questions you might have for Dr. Walker before we uh, let him sign off. But that was a great um, recap of what's been covered so far, and and good to know about um, exciting things coming up and um, for for some things right in uh, Dr. Lander's wheelhouse, and uh, great having that as well. I hope, 
Go ahead. The one thing you'll all take away from this is just from watching, you know, Eric as a teacher, how he is connecting to the students that he has in front of them. And I realize you know, the real diversity of students from different ages and different backgrounds and everything. But I think the heart of what makes Eric such an exciting teacher is is, is it abil his ability to sort of match the level of the discussion to the level of the students he's with and that way he's engaged them and there's this wonderful been this wonderful sort of sense of the team of the students taking the course. It's been really great fun to to do it and I sort of hope this will inspire a few a few of you to in your own way with your own students to try and find some way to make that kind of connection and excite them. Well wonderful. I um Dr. Warby we've got one question um a uh, question about uh, citizen science opportunities, and I think that we've got some um, other user comments coming into the chat. Um, but if you've got any um, additional comments on that one, and um, another comment from Diana saying that uh, she appreciates the uh, the way that uh, Dr. Lander uses stories to teach the concepts, so that could be um, some inspiration for teachers in the uh, K-12 arena as well. And the other thing too, you might uh I've since I've you know, one of the things I've been working very hard on are these faculty videos and we've tried uh to use them to help students see the diversity of scientists that you have at just even at one department at one university, you'll see diversity in terms of age, of gender, of where people uh came from, how they got interested in science. There's nothing cookie cutter about it uh, at all if you look at it. And I think almost all of my colleagues have made a real effort to make themselves accessible to the students. And so I hope that that will be uh, as an, um, something extra that you can maybe help students understand that scientists are not people wearing white uh, lab coats and holding an early mire with, uh, with dry ice in it as depicted in so many cartoons. But they're real people and they have real lives and the way they got into science is often a very interesting story. That's fantastic. Well, um, Dr. Walker, I think that we will uh, thank you for your time and the um, fantastic overview today and uh, go ahead and let you sign off before we jump into our pedagogical implications. You're, of course, welcome to stick around if you want to, but I um, wanted to thank you again for your time and um, we'll see you online. And I appreciate the having me and also your consideration. I have a big thesis I have to read before tomorrow. So I will sign off. I wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Um, so at this point, we will um, go ahead and turn it over to NSTA's Zipporah Miller. Welcome, Zipporah. Thank you, Bryn, and good evening, everyone. I do want to say thank you to Dr. Walker and Dr. Lander in their absence uh, for providing such a great course uh, for us. And I also want to thank um, a few people who work behind the scenes, Bryn, of course, and Jeff, to, who work really um, hard to make sure that they have these um, web seminars available to you, and Flavio Mendez um, and Al Byers. Al Byers actually oversees the um, department that has the Learning Center, and he oversees e-learning and government partnerships. So I want to say thank you. And that said, let me move on to uh, the next generation science standards. This is an exciting time for us in science education because the next generation science standards were just released. And I do want to point out that NSTA was one of the partners that was involved in this state-led effort. So um, let's talk a little bit about the next generation science standards. One of the things is, that is important to point out is that the next generation science standards consists of performance expectations. And these performance ex expectations integrate three important dimensions, the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and cross-cutting cross concepts. And with this, they also make sure that they effectively build science concepts from kindergarten through 12th grade. 
So now we can really see that with the states adopting the next generation science standards, that you can have a students from K through 12 who would have a rigorous and exciting science program in store for them, getting them prepared to pursue STEM careers if they choose in higher ed. Um, if you are looking for resources that will help you better understand NGSS and begin developing strategies of how you can implement them in your classroom, I want to encourage you to do several things. One, yesterday Stephen Pruitt actually presented a really good web seminar on the Next Generation Science Standards. And that web seminar is actually archived on our NSTA Learning Center. I encourage you to go listen to uh, the archive. In addition to that, take advantage of the resources that are found on NSTA's Learning Center. We have several archived web uh, seminars. We have a series that was done last fall on the science and engineering practices. We have um, side packs and side guides who also help you strengthen your content, content knowledge, journal articles, and um, ebooks. In addition to that, visit the NSCA's NGSS portal at nsca.org backslash NGSS where you can become aware of any professional development opportunities, any publications that are available to you as you implement NGSS within your classrooms, schools, or districts. Um, I want to talk about, uh, now move into talking about implementing in the classroom. You've spent a lot of time within the past few few weeks, or should I say longer than few weeks, with, with Eric Lander as you strengthen your content knowledge. And one of the reasons as teachers we do this is because the more, um, the stronger we get in our content, the easier it is or the more exciting it is to just implement in the classroom. So now, what about the strategies? So that's, that's the reason for this web seminar. What strategies could I best use to actually um, teach this content to my students? So as we transition, I also want to look at the, um, how some of the topics you may teach could allow, or should I say, align with the next generation science standards performance, performance expectations. I've listed two of them that you see on the screen right now, but I want you to keep in mind that when you are planning instruction, use the foundation boxes to plan instruction, and then the performance expectations is what you expect students to know and be able to do after your instruction. So. Why waste time? I do want to move forward with our um, presenters and instructors for today. So let me take a little bit of time to introduce them to you. Our presenters today, today are Susan Koba and Ann Tweed, both who are NSDA pr press authors, specifically for one, one of their books is The Hard to Teach, Co Hard to Teach Biology Con Concepts. Susan Koba regularly shares her expertise with NSCA as a consultant for the Learning Center. While with, uh, uh, she's also been with the Omaha Public Schools, where she taught science and directed the Omaha Public Schools Urban, Urban Systemic Program. And Tweed is the principal consultant with the Mid-Continent Research for Education, also known as McCrell, Education and Learning, also known as McCrell. She also serves as a co-PI for an NSF nanotech project and IES formative assessment, formative assessment using student work samples project. We are very, very excited to have them both. And uh, now we want to turn it over to Susan and Ann. Thanks, Zipporah. Um, we're really pleased to be here again this evening for the second of the Pedagogical Implications webinars, um, primarily because we recognize that pedagogical content knowledge is every bit as important as content knowledge when we're planning our instruction, and that's really at the heart of this book. I also want to remind you all of something that was briefly mentioned during the last webinar, and that is this book is much more consumable and meaningful if you share it with a colleague, discuss it with a colleague. Um, what that does is help 
as you think through lesson and unit planning, it helps clarify in your mind the ideas that should be the focus of the learning. Um, and also, I'd like to remind you the goal of the book is not to create unit plans that you can take to the classroom and use, though there are some in the book. Rather, our intent was to help um, us think through a framework and use some tools that help make thinking visible um, so we can all be smarter about planning for learning and be very explicit with our students about these hard to teach um, science concepts. Um, before we go ahead, I'd like to just briefly review what we did from our last session. Um, if you recall, we introduced our instructional planning framework and discussed both the predictive and responsive phases. We showed how to use the instructional tools to select strategies. Then we modeled strategy selection and use of strategies in the responsive phase in the context of genetics. What we would like to move ahead with today is uh, to dig a little bit deeper into a particular content area, and that is chapter six from the book, Molecular Genetics, Proteins and Genes. And this links directly to some of the work you've been doing in your course with Dr. Lander. This is also the chapter that NSTA has made available up, uh, for free upload um, and, and for your consumption. OK, very briefly, um, especially if there are some of you that weren't here during the last webinar, this is our instructional planning framework. And you will notice that um, there are two major components. There's the predictive phase. And this predictive phase is the planning that is done as we um, design units of study around those core ideas that we want our students to learn. The essential understandings are those big ideas that we want our students to walk away with. And if we're not very clear about what those are, then our students won't be very clear about what those are. This predicted phase also has, has us reflect on the sequence of learning targets that will lead our students to these understandings. And we really want to stress, don't shortchange the time you spend here. And this is a primary area where um, collaboration with a peer, discussions with your colleagues helps clarify these ideas in your own mind so that they can be um, made explicit to students. Then the responsive phase is called responsive because it's at this point we start looking at implementing our plan in the classroom and responding to student needs. Um, we identify preconceptions. Actually, we can identify our students' preconceptions several weeks before instruction and use those preconceptions to modify our initial plan in ways that best meet our students' needs. But then it's critical, once we begin instruction, to find ways to elicit student thinking. How do we keep that student thinking at the surface so that we are aware of what students are thinking, they are aware themselves, and their peers are aware? Um, now, their ideas may not may be quite naive and not the scientific explanations that we want. So we have to confront their conceptions with, in a variety of ways, using a variety of strategies, um, but providing them alternative explanations. And then, of course, sense making has to occur throughout this process. But this sense making piece is critical and one of the areas that we often least plan for. And it must be planned just like any other type of instruction. We have to find ways to know if students are getting it. And if they're not, we need to cycle back and offer other opportunities for learning. There's no point in moving ahead with learning target two if learning target one is not in place. Um, the, the learning target or the, excuse me, the um, 
concept we're looking at here in this particular webinar is the connection between proteins and genes. And this concept can be very confusing to students. And as with all challenging concepts, it's our opportunity to ask uh, ourselves what is most essential for students to learn. And again, I would say um, special attention uh, to the predictive phase and defining these pieces ourselves is essential. And what we would like to do is model a bit of what a conversation like this might look like. Actually, as Anne and I wrote the book, we did this for each of the major topics. So, so we would like to show or let you see what that conversation sounds like before we dig more deeply into the actual topic itself. So that said, Anne, as we're starting to work on this, what do you think those big ideas, the core ideas uh, we need to focus on, what, what would you address here? Well, I know that in teaching my own students, um, it was really important to link to things that they had heard about and they understood something about already. And um, from the middle schools, they had some work around genes and around DNA and um, a little bit about um, how that information was translated into inheritance. And so that's, that's one of the things that I think that is a reasonable place to start. But um, clearly to me, this notion of proteins being a critically important um, part of how things get done in organisms at different levels and making sure that they have those connections between the actions of proteins at both the cellular, organismal, um, system level, et cetera, to me is really, really important. So. Um, I'm thinking now that maybe my approach in the past of um, starting with um, macromolecules and then going to DNA and doing those kinds of things and then ending up with what these different um, structures and functions that are mitigated by proteins would be about, maybe I should start instead with the proteins as that focusing area and, the, and at the core of the essential understandings that I want for students. What do you think, Susan? You know, that really makes sense to me, and I, I know we could teach this either way, from kind of the molecular and building up, uh, or at the organismic level, and, and then dig down in. But as I was looking through some of the information, the misconceptions, some of what's written out there, what I saw was that one of the major challenges students have is um, building connections among those various levels of organization. So I, I really like the idea of starting more globally, helping kids see the connections across those levels before we start looking at the molecular level. Um, but I do wonder uh, a little bit about uh, as how soon we jump in and to what detail we go as we move through uh, these learning yeah, targets. I know what you mean because um, how do we make the segues from one to the next so that those connections are clear? And also, we still want to engage them easily with the content. So I'm going to have to have ways that really hook the kids. And, and they love hearing about mutations and things like that. But maybe they're not so excited about hearing about the structure and function of proteins. So um, I need to develop this storyline in a way, just as um, Dr. Walker was talking about what Dr. Lander does. How can I weave my story in a way that makes the um, connection seem logical as we continue with the learning for kids? So I'm kind of liking the way that we have it arranged right now. We're starting larger with the proteins and, and more globally, what are the things that proteins can do for us and how do they function? And then let's get more into the details and specifically how they work and what happens when things go awry. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pause this here because what we're Anne and I literally did go through conversations like this as we wrote the book. But what I want to make very, very clear is that this is not the way to do this. Um, there's not a single process. There aren't special activities, exact sequences, um, specific strategies. What we're trying to do here is help. Um, in support thinking about how you design. And there are multiple ways in which this was done. And just as we did that here with um, 
uh, the predictive phase and sequencing learning targets, that was a similar process throughout the whole chapter. So I'm going to turn this over to Anne now, and she's going to move forward with some thinking about how we do this. Thanks, Susan. Um, to me, in the work that I'm doing with teachers now, developing this content storyline becomes really an important process. And I think that the next generation science standards are going to help us with that because they really are focused a little bit more on those essential understandings. Um, so one of the things that used to happen to me in the classroom, because I know I taught biology for more than 28 years, and, and some of these units would get bigger and bigger and bigger because there's new information out there, there's things that will capture the kids' interest or whatever, and so um, they really were depending upon me to make sure that I was honing in on those ideas um, that were important for them to learn and were really foundational uh, to their understanding. So making those connections clear and linking back to what they'd learned previously and then putting it into that content storyline was the approach that I um, started to take, and it worked better for kids because then they could say, oh, yes, 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 I remember when we were working on this, and so this is another way that they could think about it. And as Susan has said numbers of times already, we clearly want to make their thinking visible. So one of the things that that meant for me was I probably was do, trying to do too much. And so um, even as we think about all of the things that we could include in this chapter, probably for our general biology classes, we want to still be more focused on those um, main ideas, what's at the core of their understanding. And so for me, that meant that there were a lot of topics and subtopics that I probably could eliminate because I used to have them building DNA models and, you know, structures of nucleotides and all of the, the fine details that probably was better in my AP biology class, but maybe was not fundamental to the um, regular biology class, the general biology class. So I was able to get rid of a lot of repetition from perhaps what happened in earlier classes, um, get rid of a lot of the technical vocabulary that ended up just confusing the students. So I invite you to do the same. And there is some guidance in this AAAS document um, about designs for science literacy. Of course, it was based on the previous round of standards, but still the information is good about thinking about what's important for kids. So with this first learning target, it's about proteins carrying out the major work of the cells and being responsible for structures and functions, and also our, um, how an organism looks as a reflection of the work of proteins. Um, I'd like to turn that back to you guys and have you respond. So what kind of activities have you used in the past to help students um, learn about the work of proteins? And to do this, what I'd like you to do is to go to the fourth button down, which is the text button. And if you click on that, and then you've got your text there, then that allows you to type in that box. And so I'm just going to start it off and suggest that um, my ideas uh, included. So I would invite a few of you to share what were some of the things that you've done in the past to help your students with this learning target and this understanding about the work of proteins. So I'm going to stop right now for a minute or so and give you a chance to um, join on the page. And Anne, I'll go ahead and jump in here for those who may have joined us a little bit later after we uh, looked at the toolbar in our introduction. Um, so folks, you can select from the long, narrow toolbar that's right alongside of your participant window. Um, and as Anne mentioned, it's the fourth button down the text box tool, and I see you've already got uh, someone typing a, a great message up there, so that's wonderful. Um, if, you're, if you have any trouble with the text box tool or if you happen to be on a tablet, you can enter into the chat window. Yeah, Enzyme Activity Labs, those were, those were a good way for to engage the students and really think about um, the functioning of the proteins. And then also what happened when you changed conditions and they didn't function so well, so you could get a lot of that. Um, folded activities uh, would be amazing. I know that um, with um, Dinah Zeiss and getting the kids to illustrate what they understand and um, organizing that, that's clearly something we could do. Teacher tube videos. I'm glad somebody put that up there because we do um, rely on a lot of what's out there on teacher to, especially when people have created these nice short little video clips that really prime the pump and get the kids to think and respond. 
Oh yeah, genetic disorders um, is another um, good way to think about this and the role of proteins. Yeah, dietary. <laughs> I know that somebody is, um, has got a tool inside of a box, which is kind of an interesting thing. So uh, thank you for practicing, some of you. Um, I see that um, somebody put up that there's a video made by Stanford, I believe, on protein synthesis. Um, when I Googled this, there is a lot of information out there. And um, clearly, we have to kind of paw through it to see what things are appropriate. But I just wanted to get you to think about what we've done in the past. In my own planning, I used to think about, um, here's, the, here's the ideas and the concepts I want the kids to learn. And then I would go out there and look at my textbook and a lot of other resources and pull together many things. And then I would just kind of put them in some sort of a sequence or order. But they weren't well developed in terms of connecting one to the next. So um, with the work of understanding by design and other people, it's a lot clearer to me now that it's critical that we have this content storyline and then select content represent representations that match each of these content storylines so that we're not just doing activities for activities sake, but they really are helping do representations and helping them learn. So I'm going to go ahead and move this forward. And thank you all for sharing. I appreciate that. I see that BSCS's informatics unit is another one that was added here. If you're not aware of that, I invite you to take a look uh, because I have lots of good information in there as well. So one of the things that um, came out of the literature about what do we include and what do we consider pruning was the work done by AAAS. Um, and it suggested to teachers that oftentimes we try and teach things and it takes a lot of time and kids still struggle and struggle. So if the time that it takes is disproportionate to the learning that the kids have, or if it's not really foundational or essential to their understanding for science literacy, we might think about not including that. And, and for some teachers, that meant some of their favorite topics you know, or things that maybe you didn't spend as much time on. So with the next generation of science standards, we have an opportunity again to look at those foundational pieces of understanding. So what should we be doing with most of our time? Focusing on helping them with the conceptual ideas and then bringing in that supporting vocabulary and details, rather than getting the kids bogged down in all of the fine detail. And this is clearly one of those units where that could happen with kids. And it did with mine. Because as the novice learners, we mentioned before, they really aren't clear about what's important. So they're depending upon us to make sure that those storylines are well developed. So for this, we're going to start with the predictive phase, once again, with our learning target. And part of the work that we do ourselves, as Susan was saying, was to go and do our misconceptions um, search. And one of the ones that was um, pretty important related to this first learning target is this one that suggests that kids don't understand the multitude of roles that proteins play. And that um, it hampers their ability to have explanations of the mechanisms and the explanations of the genetic phenomena because they um, have a very narrow and restricted understanding of proteins um, as a whole and even what they are, even as related to food. So don't um, forget to get smarter about what the misconception research says out there. And you'll hear me oftentimes say preconceptions because when I talk about students, it's whatever their prior ideas are. But for us, um, we know that these are ideas that don't align with the scientific thinking. So um, it is indeed misconceptions. So once we've identified those preconceptions, we have to find out what the kids' ideas are. Um, what we're going to do is try and um, give you some examples of how this is illustrated in the book. So first of all, illustrating, and then we want to go about confronting. So I'm going to move forward with that. Now, this is probably what students think of proteins. It's the, you know, do you have a protein-rich diet or not? And so to find out what their ideas are, um, we have to have a good focusing question like, what are proteins and why are they important? Because what you want to do is get the kids to think. And first, they've got to turn on their brain and think about what their ideas are. Then we want them to take them out and share them with others. And so rehearse their ideas out loud and then do that collaboratively with others. So you need some sort of a tool that allows you to do that. And so um, the tool that's suggested here as one of the possible examples is a, um, an instructional tool called the brainstorming web. 
And so with the brainstorming web, I just gave you a few of the details there. Basically, you're going to write the idea or the question in the middle, and then you're going to have different um, ovals or bubbles that branch out for them, and then add the details to it. So this allows them to do basically a brain dump and create this web in their groups. And they can do exactly what I suggested, which is turn on their brain, think about their ideas, and then share them with others and kind of rehearse what it is that they think that they know about proteins. So that's one of our places to start. If we look back at our tool selections here, remember that we're in this column that's eliciting preconceptions um, explicitly. And so this is one of the visual tools that we're talking about, which is the brainstorming web. And there's also, somebody mentioned over here on the side, there's mind mapping, there's thinking process maps. There's quite a few, um, even creating visual models of how things work. But somehow you want to find out what the kids' ideas are already before you can move to the next step of um, confronting their conceptions. So one of the ways that's suggested is to then give them some more information and connect to what, what they've already shared. And uh, a YouTube that you might think about doing that is one on protein functions in the body. So when I go to the next slide, and by the way, these are the linguistic representations. The other ones were the non-linguistic representations. Don't forget that student questioning uh, is a good way to help get some of this information out and then to talk about it. So it's going to be helpful both for eliciting and then also for confronting. So we can use it in both of those ways. So one of the things that um, uh, is critical is not only that they have these ideas and they think about what makes sense about them, but then compare it to something else. And so in this instance, they, they could take this YouTube and compare it to what they already have put down in their brainstorming webs. And I would suggest I'm um, having them to discuss their findings, revise their, revise their webs, and then ask questions about what doesn't make sense and to move on from there. So this is just one of those things that you could have students do in terms of confronting. So somebody did suggest um, showing a YouTube video. And this one is about a four minute long one. Somebody made it and it talks about all of the different roles that proteins play structurally, functionally, and all the different levels of an organism. So it's a particularly good one. We were going to show you a clip about this one, but I'm going to save it for when I hand this back to Susan. And the um, last point that I'd like to make is that we usually have um, the need for multiple opportunities and representations for kids before they truly understand things. So if I talk to them about proteins as structural components, um, having one brief activity may not um, really allow them to develop the understanding that we'd like. So think about ways in which we can go deeper um, and then have those multiple opportunities and experiences um, to engage with the learning. So I'm going to um, take it to the next step, which is Susan. And she'd already clicked, and so I had advanced it ahead of her. But um, once we have those ideas, we're confronting them, we're giving them opportunities to learn, we clearly want to go to that sense-making component. Susan? Thanks, Ann. Um, yes, so if you've got envisioned here, students started with their brainstorming web about what proteins are. They see a video that helps give an alternative view. It might support what they had. It might not. They do some modification. But what we want them to do now is kind of use and apply this information. Now, let's um, keep in mind that what we're really focusing on here at this point is an organism's traits or their phenotype are a reflection of the work of protein. The actual activity we chose to do was to let students research um, a genetic disorder. Now, um, it's really important to help uh, during this process to select a variety of disorders, but possibly some situations where proteins are functioning normally, and have students research a variety of, of, of options that require them to determine the impact of something in the, in the genes, but the impact on the various levels of organization. The other thing that's very important, as Anne said, is start with something with which they are familiar. And while not all children are familiar with sickle cell, sickle cell is a fairly common um, content area that we could focus on. As a matter of fact, I noticed somebody, when Anne was asking for 
for everyone's feedback, mentioned sickle cell. And so what I would like to do, uh, this is about a one minute video, and Bryn's going to run this for us. Okay, Susan, uh, what we will do is uh, push out the video to everyone. It'll open in a separate window. And when you're finished watching everyone, just click back on the Blackboard Collaborate window and we will continue. Okay, we should be back here now. What that brief clip did was show from the molecular to tissue level what was going on. What it didn't do was show what's hap happening to the full organism and the impact, but at least it's a starting off point for the students to, un to begin their work. So now we've got our students ready to um, launch into their own research. Um, and at this point, they can't just do research. <laughs> um, sense making takes as much planning as any other part of our planning. So while students are working, we have to give them tools that help them do this. In the book, we actually suggest that as students do their research, they use two column notes, which is an informational text strategy for active reading with which you might be familiar um, that helps them take notes but then reflect on them. We also ask them to construct tree maps, um, which is a thinking process map that helps students sort the information into those organizational levels about which we are critically concerned here because we know from the research that their ability to connect across those levels of organization is one of the major difficulties they have that limits their understanding of this content. Uh, we also ask them to do some explanation writing and critiquing of explanations. But ultimate, so there are a variety of strategies built into the lesson we developed that help present alternatives, raise conflicts, resolve those conflicts, and help them accommodate um, understanding of new concepts. Um, there's lots of different strategies that could be used here, but the ones we selected result in students sharing their research. And another critical set of teacher strategies here is listening carefully to our students and probing with questions. So while they're out there doing that research, we're not clock watchers, we're eavesdroppers. We ask the probing questions required to move them forward. But I would also suggest that as we move from group to group, we understand which groups have the most um, sophisticated understanding and those that still have a more naive understanding of the content. And I would suggest a powerful way to move forward with sharing as you hear these things from your students is um, in the presentations, ask those students with the most naive conceptions to present first. This helps you build on their understanding and sequence the presenters so slowly the story unfolds. All of this is part of the sense making. Now, um, 
I'd also like to point out there are things that aren't we that the horizon research has found strategies that support sense making that aren't as evident in the classroom. Um, and you'll see those that are circled here. A climate of lesson encourage students to generate ideas and questions. This goes back to something I said during the first webinar. We need a culture of um, open invitation to discourse where it's not about right and wrong answers. It's about our best possible explanation explanations at the time. And then that is driven to a large degree on the atmosphere, the environment we establish as teachers, the questioning strategies that we use, and the intellectual rig rigor and feedback criticism that we provide. These are key ideas in terms of sense making that all of us need to work on as we move forward. This is very sophisticated instruction and, um, and I still could use huge work <laughs> in this area. Um, I'd like to come close to closing here. I know our time is short, but to really stress that um, to support sense making discussion, discourse is critical, but discourse isn't of one type. Um, as we help students understand and lead them through discussions, we need to help them first help to perceive, interpret, and organize information. Um, some of this is recall, and it isn't very sophisticated, but we then need to help them start connecting information and developing explanations, um, critiquing those explanations and ideas. Uh, then uh, retrieve, extend, and apply that information in new ways and using knowledge in relevant ways, perhaps judgments on findings and so on. So. Discussion isn't just a simple thing. This is also very sophisticated. So in closing, um, it's really critical. Our work is just really never done. We've got to constantly check for student understanding. But you can't just do the checking. We need to analyze the information and respond. It's just so critical, responding to that, providing feedback, uh, helping students understand their next steps, asking that next probi probing question. And until they're there, we're not ready to move forward. It's only then that we can think about moving on to target two. So at this point, um, we've put a lot out there again today. We'd like you to consider what you've learned today and what next steps are important for you. They won't be the same for all of us. Each of us is also at a different level of understanding about our own instruction. And so we'd like to have you think about where you really need to focus your, your learning and in, in hone your expertise in the classroom and which of these areas it might land in. Regardless of what it is, we're all on this teaching journey together and have areas to improve on. And hopefully this has helped take one little step in that direction. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much, and Anne as well. Um, I think that we are going to uh, continue our Q&A at the other end of our evaluation. So um, folks, hold your questions uh, just a few more minutes. Um, but before we continued on to the conclusion, I did want to remind everyone about the Learning Center resources, including our digital resource collection that includes a free chapter from Susan and Ann's book. And so check out the link that I just put in our chat window. That will get you to all of the information shared on this page, including our community forums and our optional certificate that will allow you to showcase what you're doing. Um, as you think about applying some of the information that Susan and Ann have shared and really um, dig into your own professional learning, take this opportunity to um, really show what you have been doing and give yourself credit for that work by uh, purchasing the certificate option. I've put the direct link into the certificate right there in the chat. If anyone has questions on that, feel free to email me directly. I'll put my um, email address there in the chat window, um, but encourage you to take advantage of that great opportunity.
And now I would like to thank all of today's presenters, including Graham Walker, who was on with us earlier, giving us an overview of the 7000X course. A thank you to Zipporah Miller as well for giving us information about aligning course content with NGSS. And a big, big thank you to Susan and Ann for a fantastic overview of some of the strategies included in their book, Hard to Teach Biology Concepts. So everyone, let's use our emoticon button under the face and select applause to give our presenters a big hand for a wonderful uh, presentation today. We would also like to thank the GE Foundation for sponsoring today's web seminar. A thank you as well to the administration of NSTA for their support for web seminars. And here's what's coming up on the web seminar calendar, April 18th, Properties of Living Things, Searching for Fingerprints of Life on Mars. On April 22nd, Monarch Butterflies and Citizen Science. And then on April 23rd, you can learn more about the NSTA Learning Center. You can register for these and more by going to learningcenter.nsta.org slash web seminars. Thank you, everyone, again, for your participation today. And we look forward to seeing you on another web seminar.